Hello and welcome and uh, g'day to everybody who's joining us today for a preview of our brand new Yardi Property Council PropTech survey results. My name's Ken Morrison, I'm the Chief Executive of the Property Council of Australia and it's great to have so many people with us online today. We've got people scattered all around the place. Bernie, who we you'll be hearing from shortly, is actually up in Singapore, but I'm joining you from Sydney, which is on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And here at the Property Council, we acknowledge traditional custodians of country across Australia and their connections to land, sea and community, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Before we get into things, I'd like to thank Yardi for partnering with us on this important new PropTech survey. Yardi have been a long standing supporter of the Property Council, including, of course, 12 years supporting the Property Congress. And this survey was a brainwave from Yardi who said, wouldn't it be good to do a stock take of where we are at as an industry in terms of technology? And this report does provide that benchmark into technology adoption right across the industry. It's the first instalment of what will become an annual survey, allowing us to track progress year on year and against our counterparts in the Asia Pacific. A big thank you to Bernie Devine, uh, Nina Feldman and the Yardi team for all the work that's gone into producing this excellent industry survey. And the quality of the data is absolutely critical to this and every other survey that we do. And I'd like to recognise John Yen and our national research team for gathering all the data and crunching the numbers. And a big thank you to every one of you who helped fill out this, this uh, survey to provide the data that we've got in front of us today. So the format of the session is that uh, Bernie Devine will outline some of the key takeouts of the survey, and then he'll bring in our expert panelists who also contributed to the analysis of the report. And a big thank you to Jonathan, Mark, Daniel and Sheridan for joining us today and for also their input into the report. For me, in, in reading this report, I think the, the, the big driver accelerating adoption of an increased array of technologies is surely a, a focus on, on the customer. Uh, and as an industry, we've seen considerable disruption and dislocation of the past year. A lot of the trends were already there, but they have been certainly supercharged by COVID. And it's at times like this that businesses rightly look again at customer needs and do this with fresh eyes. And, this is, and in this exercise, I think technology can be the industry's friend. I'd now like to hand over to Bernie Devine, Yardi's Regional Director of Asia Pacific. Bernie's relationship with the Property Council goes a long way back. Uh, he used to have a regular byline in Property Australia back in the day when this was a monthly printed uh, magazine uh, and we had newsprint under our fingers uh, a long time ago now. The topic, of course, was technology industry that he used to write about, which is still his passion now. Bernie will share the key takeouts of the survey and then our panellists will pick these apart further. I also strongly encourage you to use this opportunity to ask the panellists your questions through our Q&A function. You can ask those throughout the session and Bernie will queue those up, introduce them to our panellists when he's starting to moderate that discussion. We'll also be recording this session for any of your colleagues who might have missed out on the session today and you will receive a link to that recording as well as a copy of the report tomorrow. Bernie, over to you. Thanks very much, Ken. That's uh, really a very nice introduction. Thank you. And uh, from from my perspective, very much thank you for uh, having me back. As as you said, it's been a long association with uh, with Property Council over a very long period of time, uh, but uh, very much pleased to be back. I'm a uh, I was born in the land of the Garrigal people, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, very much. Uh, part of, of what I, I like to promote as well. And uh, at the same time, um, Property Council uh, has has been fantastic in, in acknowledging, um, I guess, the relationship we've had over a long time as an organisation. I'm, a, I'm a, prop, a, a CPA from Australia, but yes, in Asia at the moment, looking after our asia Pack business for Yardi. And uh, I think it was fantastic that Property Council was able to help us bring this piece of work to Australia. Uh, through my long involvement, uh, I, uh, I guess I ran a version of this survey many, many years ago in Australia and across the globe in terms of listed industry. 
uh, vehicles to, to understand the performance of the industry in terms of technology. And it's fantastic that over these many years, we've now been able to bring that back and and get real data again uh, on Australia. So, so I'm, I'm really just going to touch on a couple of key things through the process and uh, it allow people to go and read the report. I don't want to I don't want to spoil it. I think the important points are that um, the majority of respondents uh, to the report were uh, to the survey were in fact folk who manage, own and invest in real estate. And that's really critical because uh, that gives a very, very clear view of where the industry is at. And it's people who have their hands on bricks and mortar who are making decisions about investing in technology. And the second thing is about that is when you look at the level of investment. So I'd have to say if I go back to 20 odd years ago, the first time I tried to run this survey, um, the majority of the industry in real estate, particularly in Australia, was sub 1% and globally less than 2.5%. So uh, it's been a dramatic shift where you can see that even some folk are up to you know, 7 plus percent, which is the sort of money that banks and telcos invest in technology. So uh, a, an enormous improvement in, in an attitude to real estate uh, or, or real estate's attitude to technology. And I think the important thing here is what it demonstrates is that folks who make decisions in real estate businesses today are putting more value on technology, are seeing more benefits from technology. Uh, and, and that's really showing in the investment in the decision making. And I'd certainly say when I look across the industry um, at the largest organisations, Australia and globally, is that when it comes to those organisations that lead the industry, it's very common that the folk at the top have a strong view that um, good business process and good technology is a key part of the platform they need to succeed and for their businesses to do well. So, so yeah, it's I think uh, the prop tech um, wave has has certainly come and uh, is having an impact on the industry and getting a lot more engagement from folks in terms of what we're going to do and see with when it comes to real estate. I think the other thing that that comes out of the the survey was a part of it was focusing on where people are and what they think the industry is up to in terms of the the technology and and what they want to invest in and what they see the real priorities and trends are and, and a couple of things came out there's definitely view a bunch of significant number of people in australia that that australia lags uh, the industry lag, lags globally in terms of uh, investment in, in in technology in the real estate industry. I think a, a few of our panelists, Jonathan in particular, will probably have something to say about that. My view, uh, sitting across APAC and talking to real estate folk every day, would be that outside of uh, outside of China, um, there's no particular lags or leads in in the region. There's a there's a couple of countries where uh, government have certainly put additional incentives in place. Uh, but for me, China is a standout in terms of the level of investment and innovation in, in technology in the real estate space and, and very much a different approach to it. When I look at uh, the, the survey and look at, you know, ask people what was, what are the trends for 2021 and beyond? And you know, where are the, where are the key, where are the key things to focus on? And it's really interesting because there's still a significant proportion of the industry who will confess that they run their large portfolios on Excel. And uh, you know, from our perspective as an organisation that provides uh, tools around uh, investing, owning and managing real estate, um, it, our largest competitor is Excel in many, in many, many places. And uh, as a result, a big part of what people are still focusing on is, is some of that core platform of saying, I've got to get my property management sorted out um, and, and big chunks of work in construction management, because obviously that is an area that has huge potential for savings. And then in terms of the, the types of things, it, it varies dramatically, but there's definitely uh, an understanding that, that business process automation is a key part of what people need to focus on. And when we looked at, in particular, you know, what does that really mean? The, the key things were that it, it's across a range of tools. And uh, although I haven't really pulled up a slide here on COVID in this short overview, we did focus in the report on COVID uh, and the impacts of COVID and what people did in response to COVID. 
And it's been really interesting because uh, when I talk to senior folk in organisations in real estate around the around the region, and ask them in particular, what would you do now? What would you have done differently back then in March last year, had you known what you know now? And a very very common response was um, dramatically increase their investment in technology two or three times on the basis that. The benefits that they have seen out of what they did invest have been significant and they really saw the opportunity now that if, if they'd done more back then they would have been a lot more advanced now so it's really been interesting to to see that and to see that the attitude in in senior you know, management positions around the region that says um, we need to do more in this space technology really does have benefits that we can take advantage of there is value so um, yeah, the, the, the things that people want to achieve, uh, there's a common theme through here, a couple of common themes, big data, business process automation and virtual tools come up many, many times. Interesting, although it gets a mention, blockchain come up in a, comes up as a very small component, but a very important component in some respects. And, and the thing I'd also say is that what came through this as well as those major themes around business process was also things around connecting uh, the business to the property. So, so really going beyond uh, just automating business process within the operations of the business and 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 engineering, but really saying how do we connect business process to the building, turn the building into a device in some respects, and and how do we how do we engage with the tenants in those buildings? Uh, so that the tenants feel more connected to the places that they that they use. So so that's a sort of part of the underlying theme here. And that's a, I think a nice segue for me to to move to the panel. I really don't want to focus too much on the report. I want to make sure that that folk go download it and read it. And uh, I'd encourage you during the course of this next part to uh, to put some questions in the in the Q and A session. Um, I'll do my best to make sure that we get some of those answered. Uh, but in terms of the panel, so we've got a really interesting group of people. We've got Sheridan and Mark and, and Daniel who all come from organisations that are, or represent organisations that are very much involved in investing in owning and managing real estate. Uh, they they face the challenges. They're, they're definitely from more the technology side of those businesses. They face the challenges of helping the businesses enable technology, adopt technology. Um, one of the things that certainly came out as a in the survey as a, a barrier to adoption was two things. One was resources, so the right skilled resources. So anyone who's who's got skills in tech and real estate is is certainly in a good place. And and two is around um, resistance to change being another barrier to to adopting technology. And and that's some of the things that that the t this team in particular face every day is is really helping organizations move forward effectively with technology and find value in technology um, and really experienced folk um, most of whom I've known for quite some time and have uh, have some really great insights and then there's Jonathan who's a little bit different so uh, Jonathan is uh, leads an organization that's focused on investing in technology for real estate from a from a private equity perspective and looking for innovation, looking for value. And I think that's the common theme here across the panel and in fact across this report is that what it aims to do is demonstrate that there is value in technology and that you know, the real estate industry is starting to find that value. And, and what we aim to do through this report is to help the industry better understand where that value is and how to capture it. Because at the end of the day, the only way that uh, investment managers uh, who, uh, you know, they're faced every day with a very common decision. Do I put another dollar into another brick or do I put a dollar into some technology to make that brick work better? And, and as long as they invest in the brick, the technology will never get a flag and never get a Guernsey. So uh, a big part of uh, this is about helping people understand where the value is so that you know, to get technology gets uh, gets the, the opportunity it, it, it should have within the industry and the and that businesses properly understand how to get value. 
So with that, I'd, I'd like to hand over to the panel. We're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a sort of a freestyle approach to things. And, uh, but I will first of all ask Sheridan to, to talk a little about some of, uh, um, I guess, the experience she's had in terms of connecting the business to, to the building and at the same time, you know, reflecting on the content of the report and really what does that mean in terms of um, how her and her team aim to uh, aim to improve the performance of their business. So, so Sheridan, happy to have your, your point of view there. Yeah, thank you very much, Bernie. Um, I would say, and Ken touched on it before, in terms of um, in terms of one of the survey findings around customer centricity, because I always think when connecting uh, the building to the business, the missing ingredient in all of that is certainly our people, because technology doesn't really solve a purpose unless it's solving for a human or a business need. So. For us, that's really around understanding the needs, whether it's of our people or our investor customers, our tenant customers, or even the communities that are coming to those buildings um, every day. And with that understanding, we can design with their needs at the centre. There might be things like a better experience in the building, um, greater efficiency and a far more sustainable way to operate the building, um, or even greater insights from the data that's coming. Um, from the building and other sources. So once we get that, then it's actually the easy bit is working backwards through the data, through the technology um, to help solve for those challenges. Um, but I am, of course, only one owner on this call. I think it would be interesting to hear um, from Dexas and AMP. So why don't I ask Mark um, if he has a different take? Mark, you might be on mute. Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> yeah, it's an it's an interesting um, dynamic, um, and particularly how we can drive better value out of these um, these investments in prop tech in particular. And I think the data piece is one that you touched on there, uh, Sheridan. Um, one of the challenges for landlords in particular is we are now generating a huge amount of data in our assets, and how can we tap into that information to both drive efficiencies in the building, but improve the experience of our, our tenants. And, and typically, um, what we've seen in our industry is we're, we're very focused on a historical view of, of information and data. Um, and going forward, we're now getting to a more of a real time. We've got our finger on the pulse view of how our assets are performing and how our customers are performing. I think where our industry needs to head, um, and particularly when we talk about the adoption of prop tech um, in our industry, using tools such as AI, which we're already experimenting with, how do we move our industry into a better predictive view of how both the assets are performing to really drive where the investment needs to be, but also how our customers are performing within that asset? Because ultimately, ultimately we, we provide these, um, these assets for our customers to really drive performance and productivity for their businesses. And if the prop tech that we're delivering does not achieve that outcome, then you really have to have a look at yourself and understand why we're even doing it. And this is a piece that I think is missing in our industry. Um, we, we tend to really focus on we will build it and they will come approach. I think COVID has changed that dynamic in particular, and it's forced us to really understand and touch base with our customers to trial these technologies with our customers and see if they are going to deliver those benefits before we embark on what typically are, are quite significant investments in technology. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, and Daniel, maybe you've you've got a contribution to make. I I, I guess yeah, one of the things I'd like to to hear from you is uh, where where do you see really is, the, is the, the push for innovation. You know, your background, your responsibility is much more around the building. Um, where do you see the push for innovation and how that is going to impact on the, on, on, uh, on the industry? Yep, um, I think the push for innovation is really a, a twofold approach. I certainly think from a landlord perspective in the current climate, um, there's a lot more sort of um, awareness that innovation will really drive, I guess, those efficiencies in how we manage our assets. Um, so I certainly think there's been a better uptake around that, certainly around the fr frictionless experience around for our, our customers and our retailers and even the, the visitors in our buildings and, and the community. But certainly equally on the flip side, 
there has been more of a, a demand from, I guess, the tenants and our visitors in our census as well. So I think it's a, it's certainly a two-pronged attack. Um, prop tech can really be, I think the penny's starting to drop that. It can be a really great mechanism to drive our corporate objectives a lot quicker as well. So whether that be an ESG 2030 sort of target strategy um, and really around um, personalization. So there's a big emphasis around um, providing that personalized experience, something which you potentially can't get at home or just you know shopping on the couch. I think certainly that immersive personalized experience and those seamless experiences is certainly what um yeah a lot a lot of um people are after. And yeah, I think to everyone's point before, um, everyone's very much data hungry at the moment. Our buildings are generating a wealth of data. It's how we can use that practically to drive some really um sort of solid use cases and, and outcomes for our tenants and I guess the business. Okay. And and Jonathan, I know you're dead keen to uh, make a contribution here. And in particular, I guess in terms of the report, the, the commentary around the positioning of Australia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the global industry and technology uh, investment. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. So I, I think the, the research showed that Australia was doing OK. Um, but I think if we break it down a bit further, so you know we've been operating in this space for the past six years out of Australia. Um, as you mentioned very clearly, you know the Chinese market and certain Asian markets are far more advanced in their adoption of technology. Um, they're often doing it um, in stealth mode. So a lot of the Asian developers are actually very active in this space, but they are not making big announcements. They're, they're really, um, they're testing and trialing opportunities within their portfolios as a way to differentiate their, their businesses. Um, I think the key in Australia is that we've got a great focus on sustainability and you know all of the panelists here, their, their businesses have signed up to Gresby. They're um, market leaders in sustainability. And so a lot of the technology that we're seeing is actually impacting on ESG initiatives, sustainability, um, digitalization of, of processes. So um, in that part, Australia is well ahead. Um, but I think you know, many of our chief executives don't believe in innovation. I think that uh, we have an industry that has really struggled with change and um, we probably need to start thinking about, and Ken touched on the customer and the process of actually understanding who our customer is. Um, you know, for us, the customer is absolutely everything. The tech companies have all the data that they could ever want about our customers, but the owners of the real estate don't have that data. Um, so we need to work a little bit harder to, um, as Daniel mentioned, to to bring in, I guess, some of this, uh, you know, almost like a, we need we need to have better control of the data that the buildings are delivering, so that it can be better used to actually make a change. Sheridan, you might have some thoughts on this one. Yeah, I just don't think it's only in the sustainability area where Australia is a leader. I think we are also a leader in the um, in the tenant experience. And, and the tenant experience app space. Um, I've certainly, having come from working um, in the Asia region and in a multinational field, that that's the case. Um, but I would say that um, real estate is quite a localized business. So unlike tech, tech firms or other more globalized industries, um, we don't see necessarily that level of competition that provides a breeding ground um, for innovation to really take hold. Um, and sometimes we might need um, a catalyst, whether we call it a pandemic or some other um, situation um, that might uh, that might be a um, be, be a, um, an instigator of adopting more technology. And I certainly think we're seeing that post COVID. Mark, did you have anything to say on that? Yeah, look, I, I think Australia, due to our remoteness is very much forced into having to spread our tendrils far and wide in researching prop tech. And I think we have the advantage in doing that. 
that what you see within our assets when we do deploy um, any technology is that we've done it in consideration of what we believe are the best technology that the world can offer. What you see on a regional basis, particularly in the US and Asia, they're very focused on products and technology and prop tech that has been developed in their local region. Um, we've developed, we've deployed technology from Israel, Europe, um, the Americas, Asia, in um, several of our assets. And I think that's one of the advantages Australia has. And having said that, we've got a very diverse and very strong prop tech um, cohort coming through the ranks, which I think, um, Jonathan, you could attest to, because one of the reasons we engage through the Taronga Group is that that also helps us um, in that research of, of reviewing what technology is available. Have, once we've done that, I think Australia has been very, very proactive in trialling and testing these technologies throughout our asset classes from industrial office and, and retail. Um, and in many of the areas that I've experienced globally, um, in particular our customer experience, as Sheridan has mentioned, I think Australia is really at the forefront of that. And, and sure, China may be leading in certain aspects, but you've also got to understand some of the jurisdictional challenges that we would face, particularly around privacy, compared to um, a country such as China, where they don't have those impediments that Australia does. Um, it's not necessarily an impediment, but it's more of a consideration that we need to take. I think it's a good point, Mark. We've had a number of um, really successful prop tech exports that are now over in the US, whether it's Equium or CeraView being, being sold off um, to one of the major IWMS providers. Um, uh, switch automation, I think, is one, another I can think of off the top of my head. So it's not like we haven't had really good domestic product that's also gone international. And I don't necessarily think, um, to your point, Mark, that we, we are actually quite open to taking um, prop tech from elsewhere and even from other industries, right? I don't think we're constraining ourselves to just what we would define as prop tech, but also fintech, compliance tech, there's a range of different options available to us if we're clear what need we're actually addressing in the first place. Yeah, and Jonathan, what about the the prospect you mentioned about how across Asia some of the developers are taking it in stealth mode? Um, what's your view on sort of where the line is between uh, real estate companies becoming software companies and uh, as opposed to investing in software? They shouldn't do it. <clears throat> it's pretty simple. Um, there are some big developers that are spending you know, more than $40 million to invest into creating their own software for digital twin. Um, we don't get that. So imagine a, you know, a, a major developer produces a software. Um, nobody else is going to use it because they're going to be concerned about their loss of information to a competitor. So I think it's, um, you know, software is a really interesting space. Um, the, um, I think the developers that we're dealing with the most, they're actually understanding that they need to have quite a broad range of approaches in this space, which might include direct investment, co-investment, it might be a fund, but it also might be bringing the organization on that cultural journey. And that's where, so the growth program that we have is very much about taking you know, a, a broad group within an organization on, on that journey of discovery. Because I think, you know, if we jump back to Sheridan's point about sort of the tenant um, app space and what we're seeing is that it's still very difficult for us to put a financial return on the tenant rep app. Um, as we could say that, um, you know, it's difficult to find out the return of an $80 million upgrade on a lobby, but, the resistance to that sort of the technology approach is is real because um, it is difficult to actually put a financial number on it. Um, and that's one of the things that we really try to do is to have each of the, the companies we invest in give us a financial outcome because we've got to navigate the CEO and the CFO as well as the asset manager. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things here is, is that value is really important, right? Getting the, the CEO and the investment committee to, to sign off on, on a project on the basis of value is, is one of the keys here. So, so I, I guess, Daniel, 
I, I'm going to take a little bit of your time to ask about you know, IoT in particular and the value of IoT. I mean, I guess my question is, is the, are the real estate folk and the, so the business side of your organisation seeing value in IoT as a, as, a, as a piece of technology and are they adopting it? Are there any challenges? Yeah, that, that's actually a really good point. I think um, IoT is a great piece of technology or technology set, but it's only really valuable if it's actually really uh, solving a business issue or a specific use case. I mean, you know, that that otherwise would be quite cumbersome from other tech or systems to historically solve. I mean, in my opinion, IoT has bridged the gap to solve many issues quickly and more cost effectively um, to gain that really quick insights to drive, I guess, the better outcomes for our tenants and customers and um, yeah, even, even the business. So yeah, I think um, once you sort of um, relate IoT back to a specific business objective or tenant experience, I think that's, that's when the penny really drops and yeah, the business does um, see value in it then. But you can't just really put in IoT for IoT's sake, for instance. Yeah. 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 Mark? Yeah, look, for, for IoT to be really effective um, for our customers, I think that the key foundation that we really need to focus on here is to have really good connectivity solutions in our building. That's something the landlord can actually control. <clears throat> um, IoT itself, there's so much emerging technology in the IoT space that to anticipate that the landlord is going to bring this smorgasbord of IoT to the table, I think is um, a, bit, a bit misleading. I think the best thing we can do is arm our buildings with great connectivity, but build on the concept of a plug and play type building. I think that's the best way to think about IoT um, because most of our customers will already have a series of IoT um, devices and platforms that they want to bring to the table. And the best thing we can do as landlords is help with the seamless integration of that into the building um, for our customers. So it's not, um, there's a, not a cost burden for them to do that. And I think that's really the direction of IoT. Certainly as a landlord, we will bring some things to the table, but I think it's got to be a blend of customer and, um, and landlord um, coming together. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's been really interesting. I, I watched uh, the results of a, another survey last year on, in, interestingly enough, on on technology, um, well, on telco vendors and the quality, uh, the consumer's view of telco vendors. And what it turned out was that uh, the way a lot of consumers rate telco vendors is around the quality of their indoor service, which in reality has got nothing to do with the telco vendor. It's all to do with the building owner. And, uh, and the building owner's ability to work with the telco. But it, it really sort of turned the whole thing on its head in terms of the telcos came away from that survey saying, we, we have to look at this differently because it, our me the measure of our performance is not in our control. So uh, yeah, an interesting space. And I, and I think that's something that uh, you know, we all need to understand in terms of technology is that uh, what the con once you really reach out to the consumer, once you touch the consumer, the views and the perceptions that become reality can often have nothing to do with what everyone in industry thinks it's about. Um, you know, who, who, whose problem are you solving and who thinks they're getting value can be very, very different things. Yeah, Bernie, I think if you, if you want to delve down the path of telcos um, in property, I think we might be um, <laughs> setting ourselves up for a whole panel session just on that topic alone. Um, no, I, I wouldn't disagree. I wouldn't disagree. On that one. No, I don't want to go anywhere on that one. Just I think a, an interesting juxtaposition to the point Absolutely. and the fact that, uh, yeah, from a, from I, I do think, yeah, what we've seen across the globe is that uh, owners of buildings who focus on enabling rather than delivering is really where a lot of the value is because the variety of solutions is far too extreme. No one can do everything and uh, enabling it a bit like a device, a bit like saying um, we're Apple or we're Android and you can you can put your apps on our building. Um, that's really sort of I think the approach that, uh, that at the end of the day will, will become much more prevalent. And uh, I guess Sheridan, uh, you know, when we talked about this earlier, one of the things I saw was um, one of the comments you made was around demonstrating value. And you know, for me as a as a CPA and an economist, I'm very much about the business case and sort of show me the money. Where's the ROI? 
Um, otherwise, I'm going to put my money into bricks and mortar instead of technology. So um, you, you mentioned a sort of a different approach to that. How do you see it? Yeah, I, um, I, I do think that there is this tendency to slip back into um, traditional approaches for, for large technology investments, where as where we're thinking about it is actually, why don't you take the investment smaller? Why don't you start small? Why don't you get not technology, but a cross-functional group of people together? Um, be very clear about what you're trying to solve for. Um, and that will often involve not just technology, but people changing the way that they work and reimagining um, what they do every day. So if you've got that together, start small, test and learn, add as you go, build up enough evidence so that by the time you're looking to invest at scale, you actually have evidence that this is an approach um, that will work. I think it's very hard in um, an emerging space like PropTech to go after massive investments um, without some form of evidence. Jonathan? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think maybe the key there is also quick wins. Um, so if, we've, if there's anything that we've done that's been, I guess, more successful, it was to we're actually quite a slow investor. So we invest um, into companies. We've now made 15 investments. Um, we give them a little bit of capital. We seek to see them deliver what they've told us they will deliver. And um, obviously, Mark, we've had some great case studies where um, what they promised us didn't quite get delivered as we work through the process. Um, so a lot of what we do is actually educating the emerging tech company to say, you know, you need to manage the expectations of, of the REITs. You need to be able to navigate. And if anything, if you can um, over deliver, um, that would actually be a much better out outcome and you'll get more traction. So um, we focus on slightly later stage investments because of that sort of philosophy. Um, and then these things can be plugged into a business quite quickly because the tech has already been tested. They might be already in 500 buildings in the US. So to bring them into an Australian building is actually quite easy. But um, I think Sharon and the key is a quick win. And actually internally, we don't talk about that very much, but if you have a quick win and you can demonstrate to the management team that this was a good investment and actually it delivered. Um, you know, we've, our, our portfolio, we did the annual, um, I guess the annualized returns. The returns for this space were actually phenomenal, far greater than we would have expected, far greater than our hurdle. Um, so it does deliver financially, but you need to celebrate it. Yeah. I think um, I'd like to just celebrate that. I think, you know, when we're always um, piloting technology, I think it's important to um, not just lead it from a technology perspective, but potentially just uh, have that being run by the asset teams. And I think a good spread of assets as well. So you might have your premium super regional uh, centres and then you need to make sure that that type of tech can also be applicable to your smaller industrial or BNC grade sort of commercial assets. So if you can prove value and demonstrate those quick wins across a broad sort of asset base, then you've got the solid foundation to say, well, yep, it works for the larger assets. It's equally as valuable for the smaller ones. And that will, you know, provide some pretty solid foundations to scale across, you know, an entire portfolio. Yeah, it's a great point. So, so we like to go in as high as possible, but also we like to work in at the asset level because if you can get the traction at the asset, um, it's often actually it's actually a smoother process to to get things approved. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's it's around I guess the change management. If you get the asset teams on board and then they start to sing the praises around that tech. I think that sort of really does filter up throughout the chain in terms of endorsement and approvals, not just from top down. And and Jonathan, what's your view? I mean, you, you have a unique position in this group in terms of really looking uh, in a different way at, at the vendor side of the industry and, and, and seeing what it's doing. Um, what, what's your view in terms of sort of capacity and capability? Uh, when I look at this report, it talks, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of it talks to the fact that there's you know, really been quite a pendulum shift, I think for a range of reasons, towards uh, greater adoption of tech and, and pushing tech further to the edge of the business. And both in terms of engaging with consumers and also connecting to the building. And, and at the same time, you know, some things have just completely died because we have to focus on COVID, right? Uh, so, 
What's your view in terms of capacity and capability of the vendor side to really meet the, the new demands and expectations of, of both the industry and I guess ultimately consumers, uh, the occupants of buildings? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. So I think what we're seeing, because we have a, a global mandate from a from a deal sort of point of view, we, we had uh, just over 300 companies applied to our most recent growth program. Um, and often there are people that are coming from the real estate sector that have identified a problem or a process or a weakness, um, and they've actually gone about solving it and then created a business out of that outcome. And that's, a, that's the type of founder that we really like. Um, he or she understands the challenge. Um, they're not just producing something that they think is you know, a, a fad or they're actually trying to solve a real problem. Um, I guess in the discussions we've had with our investors and partners, many of them have moved on from COVID already. So especially in Australia, we're in a really fortunate position where you know, it does appear that we're coming out of it. People are coming back to work. They're going back into shopping centers. Um, the rest of the world isn't actually like that. Um, there's actually still huge disruption across mm -hmm. Europe and the Americas. So um, what we're seeing though is that the, the corporates, um, they're actually demanding more and more tech and more solutions because they're looking beyond COVID and to the next, the next mm -hmm. horizon, which um, for many of them, it includes sustainability um, or you know, winning back new customers or whatever it may be, they're, they're looking beyond this, this sort of strange period we're in. Sharon? Hey Jonathan, um, I just wanted to ask you something about that because um, while you might get really great prop tech companies that understand the challenge, have built a great solution to solve for that challenge, um, but they built that in a vacuum to some degree. We've all know that um, the, the divergence in data and the lack of standards in data is made it really difficult for us as owners to piece all of those solutions together into something that's meaningful at a portfolio level or at the customer level. Do you see that changing um, in any way? It, it's slowly changing. So um, you're right that you know, when they we actually see quite a lot of deal flow coming out of um, things like CSIRO and universities where the ultimate customer test has been put in um, so they've got this technology and they think that it should have a market. Um, and so part of what we come in is to actually help um, identify a broader range of customers for that product. Um, some of them might think that they're targeting the commercial space, but in actual fact, their technology might be better in another sector, but they've never even thought of that. Um, so I think um, it's, it's part of the journey. Um, Mark, you might have some thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I actually believe this is one of the biggest challenges of emerging prop tech companies is, is really understanding the problems they're trying to solve from both a landlord and a customer point of view. Typically, most of the technology that we see emerging solves one um, contained problem. But what we're trying to solve for is a whole series of experiences for customers in a building. Now, you've got to understand that the, the bulk of our portfolio of assets are aged anywhere between one year to 50 plus years. And so that means that a lot of the legacy technology that these solutions need to bolt into is very diverse, um, has been deployed on a very different time cycle, meaning they've got a whole different blend of incumbent technology in those assets for which this single solution needs to integrate and operate with to make it really effective. So the biggest challenge having solved a problem in one asset doesn't mean that can easily be picked up and applied to another asset within our portfolio. So I believe uh, one of the things that we need to get better at, and this is, is part of what we do with Jonathan and his team, is educate these emerging companies to really understand don't just solve that particular point problem, solve the bigger issue around interoperability, integration, scale. These are the things they need to solve to make their solutions really effective in our portfolios and not just a flash in the pan in a single asset. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That, no, that's a really good point. And I think uh, it leads to you know, what I think is an, in, an important part of the discussion. And that is, uh, as I mentioned in sort of the intro, you know, one of the largest technologies still used today in most real estate companies is, is Excel. And uh, those of us who understand Excel 
uh, understand its limitations and its benefits. Uh, and and in the hands in the hands of an uneducated person, Excel is a very dangerous tool. So uh, <laughs> um, I, I guess you know, what what I you know, we've talked a little bit there about data, and what I'd like to come around to, and there's a question here about data. And uh, rather than answering that question specifically, I think there's more a, a, a broader question about data. And and I I see a couple of key things there, and one of them is really within organizations, one of the things that many organizations come to us with as a question is, how do we get, we want to get good management data. And, and our answer traditionally is always, is you've got to start with a foundation. It's like a building, a strong foundation, you can then get strong data. Um, but, but Sheridan, I know you've done a lot of work in this space. So what's your thoughts on, you know, how do we get good data? Yeah, look, let me just start by, start by saying I think Excel gets really demonized and I think we've got to stop doing that because frankly, um, it's the only tool we I really had when I came out of university. So it's a tool we've all grown up with and I think we just need to recognize that. We My do, business but, partner wrote VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet. So <laughs> I've been involved in spreadsheets for a long time. But the, the problem is you, you've just highlighted is that it, data that just sits in an Excel spreadsheet is only good for that purpose. And where it's replicated for another purpose in another Excel, spree, Excel spreadsheet, you end up with all sorts of efficiency and risk problems because you're not leveraging that core um, and solid foundation. So I think we've got to start treating data really seriously. Um, but again, I would go back to that's not a race to go and get data. It's not a, hey, let's go grab all the data that we can get. It's, it's being very clear about what data, for what purpose, how do you actually capture that data in a systematic way, integrate it wherever in your platform it needs to be used for whatever purpose it is, and take people on that journey. Um, I think in the report it talks about big data analytics, and my comment was uh, I think we should focus less on big data analytics, but rather about multidisciplinary challenge solving. So how do we get really clear on our challenges, work backwards through technology and data, together with um, real estate subject matter expertise, working alongside technologists um, to really start to um, to really start to get the benefits of efficiency, risk reduction, scalability, um, insights, um, and to start to be able to apply technologies like artificial um, uh, intelligence that will help people move the mundane work that they do into something that's far more meaningful. Um, but I don't think we'll get there by demonizing Excel any further. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, look, I, I, I would agree to an extent, but uh, but at the same time, I've, uh, I guess I have seen a lot of business processes fail and it'll cost the people, a lot of people a lot of money when it comes to managing portfolios in Excel in particular. But uh, yeah, I, I would agree that, that starting with the, the business solution is a key part of that. And and I, I think Daniel, you know, what are the what sort of the, the approach you've taken to helping the business understand how to use use technology better? What tools have you, you know, we look here about we talk here in the report about resources, about about uh, resistance to change. Yeah. yeah. How, how have you worked to overcome that? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I think with any sort of technology initiative, I think it's really important to back that up with some uh, certainly internal expertise as well to really help um, sort of guide and sort of uh, foster, I guess, the collaboration between, I guess, the, the end recipients being the assets and those techn technology partners. So you, you've really maximising, I guess, the value of the investment in that piece of tech. So from our, from our perspective, I guess we've got some centralised expertise that will help our sites, um, um, you know, interact and, and sort of get the most value out of the tech. Certainly, it's around um, having, I suppose, just some really informative uh, user specific dashboards as well to really sort of highlight or showcase the results or the KPIs um, that are important to that particular user. So you might have some views specific for an FM, which would be different from a sustainability um, sort of person as a uh, different as well from a, like an investment or a fund manager as well. So I think it's around using tech and displaying, I guess, the, the metrics in in ways that they can best sort of, um, well, interpret it to, to their sort of um, business function. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's really around backing up that 
that centralized um, experience, yeah, for to overcome okay. that change in an issue. Okay. No, that's a good point. And and Mark, from your perspective, I think one of the key things has been. I know I know you guys have been big on sort of the understanding the customer. Um, and as Sheridan said, you know, big data is fantastic, but we've got to get little data right first. So uh, yeah, I, I think on the one hand, there's a there's you know there's a question here about understanding a complete more complete view of the customer. Whereas uh, for me, part of it is. Um, about understanding, um, I think more the the data that we have and the data that we own, and you know, so a lot of data governance questions. But using that as the basis for understanding how can the business get more value out of the data of it it has. Uh, what sort of things have you done? You know, when I, when we look at that 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 sort of data analytics space. In terms of getting the right data and then um, making it as valuable as possible. Yeah, you touched on a, a really good point before, Bernie, around um, building strong foundations. And what we find typically in our industry is um, back to the point on spreadsheets. Our industry really evolved on spreadsheets, um, and it made it extremely difficult to draw a consolidated view out of. Um, any decision process um, within our business or within any business, I'd say most of the REITs have exactly the same problem. Um, so the, the biggest challenge there is, is really consolidating those data sets in a way that information is what I would call distributed in a self-service mechanism for our business. Um, I made the comment before that historically we've gone from this, we've gone from a historical view of data. So what happened last month? We're now getting very close to a, a real world in, in bringing that data together in, in single data sets. And as you know, we've just in the throes of completing a major Yardi implementation, which actually has brought together hundreds, if not thousands of spreadsheets and other data sources into a single repository. That gives us a really strong um, opportunity to have real time access to information. So as a, a lease deal is being done, we're seeing that flowing directly into the valuation and forecast for the asset real time, as opposed to a process that would typically take maybe a month for that information to flow through to decision makers at the other end of the, the pipeline. Um, going forward, we cannot as an industry take advantage of capabilities such as AI and other tools um, if we don't have a good handle on data governance standards about how our data is generated and created, but also the quality of what people are putting into our systems. I think there's been a bit of carte blanche on what people put into um, a lot of these technologies, a lot of the solutions that run our operations or run our business operations. And we're seeing a lot better discipline and understanding around that. Um, back to something that Daniel mentioned earlier around how do you influence people to adopt and take on this, these type of technologies? Well. I think as a business, we also need each stakeholder from an asset manager, a facilities manager, all the way through to someone in say our acquisitions team who may be consuming some of that data to understand the flow of information. Because the information you're putting into this system has a knock on impact, not directly to yourself and your role, but to somebody else's role. And I don't think we've done a very good job of people in our business understanding the flow on impact of good quality data throughout our business. And I think they're, they're some of the challenges that we're facing and, and hopefully as an industry, we can overcome um, uh, pretty quickly because the demands are certainly there. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And thank, thank you for the ad, that's wonderful. Uh, the, uh, I, I think the, uh, the key thing there is uh, by moving from um, spreadsheets to systems and really connecting business units up in, you know, business processes that flow across across a business. You certainly, you're right. You you, and it's one of the things we see all the time. You highlight knock on effects, relationships, and interactions that that historically took a long time to to happen, and now they happen very quickly. And that really changes the way that businesses have to operate. And uh, yeah, one of the points here about adoption is that. It's been interesting for me to watch how organisations, once they uh, implement systems like ours, 
how that impacts on their um, on, on their commentary around uh, the, the 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 I guess the whole point of where is you know where is the value in the system? How do I maximise this? And it does take time for people to really understand how they can they can improve the performance of their business once they've got these new tools that that change things. So I think we're uh, we're getting close to, to to end of time here. I think we've got one or one or two more points to to add. So Jonathan, um, what's your view uh, in terms of sort of where to next? Wow, it's a great question. So um, I think for us, the key the key number of, I guess, changes that we're seeing in the industry, um, we're doing a lot of work on work from home and how to get people back into the office. We're doing a lot of work on the retail sector. Um, so obviously with so many more purchases now online, how do we win back consumers to the shopping centres that you know, many of our owners and, and investors have? Um, and then that's sort of the next phase of this um, sustainability is is probably one that is getting a lot of attention now because some of the technologies that we're seeing are actually they're actually game changing. So um, we've just made investments in cement um, where we can actually capture carbon in carbon carbon dioxide into cement. Um, we're about to do a distributed system for um, solar panels across uh, multifamily. Um, and we're doing a marketplace for retail, which is you know, some of these things, these these issues that we're trying to address at the portfolio level and, and making investments into technology that will address them. But um, okay. the biggest issue here is that for each one of our panelists, their institutional investors are all focused on innovation and technology as a differentiator. Every one of your investors is now talking about this space. So um, I think, as managers of real estate, there is there's no doubt that the only way out of this uh, COVID period is through the great adoption of digitalization and innovation. Wow, thank you. Uh, I, I would have struck uh, powerful powerful stuff, right? myself. Yeah, powerful stuff. Thank you. Anyone would think you rehearsed that. <laughs> so uh, as I'm 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 under under some pressure to wrap up here. First of all, I want to say so, Sheridan. Um, what what would be your answer to one one sentence answer to a really quick question, which would be uh, return to office? Uh, I think that you have to layer on uh, different technologies in order to make sure that, first of all, people have physical safety, but really the role that technology will play in furthering placemaking efforts, I think, is a space to watch going forward. And uh, OK, thank you. And Danielle, to switch things around a little, I'm going to give you one word to talk about for one sentence. What's and that is Excel. Oh, uh, Excel. Um, yeah, I think Excel is a good tool, but I think, yeah, getting the data out of that in a consistent um, repository is key. Yeah. OK, fantastic. And and Mark, I'll give you one one topic, which is artificial intelligence. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. Well, AI is only as good as the data that um, that you apply it to, and I, and um, the industry data typically hasn't been up to scratch. But uh, I think we've got a long way to go. Um, but there's significant efforts in there, and it has to be addressed at an industry level, not necessarily just on a, 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 a individual landlord level. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So folks, uh, we're, we are on a time limit and we're right there. So I will briefly thank the panel and thank you all for attending and hand over to Property Council to Cathy, who's going to uh, wrap things up for us. So thank you very much for your attention and your time today. Thanks so much, Bernie. Um, and a big thank you for such an expert moderation of a very rich and lively discussion. And also that a capture at the start of the survey results. Uh, thanks to Sheridan, Daniel, Mark and Jonathan for being such great panellists. Uh, it was such an engaging conversation. I loved every minute of it. I feel like I just want to do a deeper dive on so much of that information. So thanks for bringing the survey and all those issues alive so much to us this morning. And thanks to the 376 people and more who are tuning in around the country. Um, we're delighted that you're part of today's event and we thank you for your time. And I'd like to take this opportunity also to um, again recognise Yadi's 
outstanding and long-standing contribution to the Property Council. And as Ken mentioned, you know, they've been a big part of Congress and you'll see their name up in lights again this year when we're in Hobart in October. We're very thrilled to be coming back face to face this year for Congress. Um, Yadi have been part of the Property Council for many, many years and all across the country and actually started in 2002 with a New South Wales Division lunch organised by Bernie Devine. So Bernie, you've been with us all those years side by side and your support helps us to do our advocacy work and, uh, and provide our services to our members. So thank you so much. And before we close today's event, a shout out to a virtual site tour that we're doing on the 10th of March. And this one's looking at the healthcare industry. We're looking at two um, amazing projects, one in suburban uh, Victoria and regional New South Wales, and that's going to be hosted by Centuria. So we're looking at the projects, the design, the development, the management, but we're also looking at um, what does that sector look like now and in the future, and, and some commentary around the asset class. So that's on the 10th of March. We'd love you to join in for that. So thanks again to Bernie and the Yardi team, panellists today, everyone who made this possible. We're thrilled to have this uh, survey up and running and we look forward to next year's results. Thanks everyone. Thank you. All right. There are live